Welcome to chapter 16, which is marine and coastal systems. Uh, we have been talking about freshwater use up until this point. Now we're going to be talking about saltwater life and saltwater use. So let's go ahead and get started. So this is part one. And our first, th these slides aren't 100% lined up. There's some that are a little bit out of order. I promise, promise that I will let you know where we are as we go through these slides. Okay, this particular slide covers both questions one and two. And question one says, uh, name and locate the five major ocean basins. I'll name them and I'm gonna show you a picture in just a second of where they all are. It's the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Arctic, the Southern, and the Indian. Please notice that Arctic has two C's in it, although nobody will mark any points off on the national exam, and I won't either. If you spell it incorrectly, when you spell stuff incorrectly, you kind of show people that you don't know what you're talking about. So it is Arctic in the same way that it is Antarctic. So make sure you put those two C's in there. Um, the Da, 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 da. How much of the world's surface is covered by the ocean? That would be 71% of the world's surface is covered by this one world ocean. And when I say one world ocean, it basically means that they're all connected. We just divide it into five large areas for convenience sake, as the slide says. And then how much of the world's surface is uh, surface water is in the ocean? Your book says 97.2%. Remember 97% and you will be in good shape. This is not a question or in the book, but just remember that the Pacific Ocean contains more than half of the Earth's water and covers one third of the Earth's surface, making it the largest uh, part of the world ocean. All right, here's where the world ocean is. So you need to know, especially living in the United States here in the state of Florida, the ocean that is on the ocean side of Florida is the Atlantic. So between the US and Africa, it is the Atlantic, so you have to cross the Atlantic Ocean to get to Europe. All right, on the other side of the United States, on the West Coast, that is the Pacific Ocean, so that is in between the West Coast of the United States and Eurasia um, and the Philippines and all that other good stuff. The Arctic Ocean, and you can see it is spelled incorrectly here, grr, um, the Arctic Ocean is uh, between the Arctic Circle itself and the lower continents up here. Um, the Southern Ocean is the only place that you can circumnavigate the globe and not have to change your course once to go around land. So this is a completely unbroken area. And it's one of the reasons why the uh, Southern Hemisphere does not have tundra, because that's where the tundra would go in the place that there is the ocean. The Indian Ocean is um, yeah, uh, near India, and then it's also bounded by the uh, one side of Africa and then also one side of Australia. And the, yeah, I think that pretty much covers it. Atlantic, Pacific, Indian, uh, Southern, and Arctic. So be able to label a map. All right. Um, identify the elements that are in ocean water. Uh, most of the ocean's elements are um, going to be uh, the sodium ions and the chloride ions it is not sodium and chlorine. Those are both toxic substances. They are the ion for, forms of those. And this 30.6 and this 55%, that, that's not referring to the ocean. That's referring to the uh, amount of mi minerals in the ocean. If you're actually take, to take a volume of water and boil the water away, um, uh, salt, uh, table salt, sodium chloride would make up 3% of that volume. So the ions in order of decreasing concentration besides sodium and chloride, um, and there's more chloride than there is so sodium, is the sulfate ion, which is SO4 2 minus. Oh, by the way, chloride is Cl minus and sodium is Na plus. Uh, magnesium, which is Mg2 plus, calcium is Ca2 plus, potassium is K plus, and then bicarbonate, which is HCO3 minus, which goes into this other category. Um, am I going to test you on this particular quiz on what the charges on those ions are? No, but by the national exam, you really need to be able to identify those ions and to write them charged correctly on the national exam. Do not refer to what's in the ocean as sodium. It is the sodium ion. If it was sodium, 
it would be a silvery dullish metal that when it touched water would have a violent reaction that would among other things catch on fire all right i'm going to skip momentarily question four and go to question five which is where does the oxygen in the ocean come from it is largely produced by photosynthetic plants bacteria and phytoplankton such as you're seeing right here um, it also comes from atmospheric diffusion the atmospheric gas is going into the water but as a matter of fact, 40% of the world's oxygen comes from these little phytoplankton, phyto meaning light, and plankton is stuff that doesn't really swim on its own, it kind of drifts around. Um, so yay for little dudes photosynthesizing in the ocean. So I'm gonna go ahead and cover questions three and five together. Um, excuse me, not three and five, uh, four and six. So identify areas of high and low salinity in the world ocean. Areas where you have low salinity would be at the equator because there's lots of precipitation or rain there. Um, high would be at what we call the desert latitudes, if you remember uh, where the Hadley and Farrell cells meet. That's at 30 degrees north and south of the equator. That's because evaporation exceeds precipitation. So in the same places you find desert are the same places that you find areas of high salinity in the ocean for very similar reasons. Uh, why do salinity concentrations differ from place to place? It's because it's differences in runoff rates, uh, water physically running along the ground into the ocean, uh, precipitation rates and evaporation rates. So uh, when those things differ, that's where you either get, uh, when evaporation exceeds, when water out exceeds water in, that means your salinity levels are high. When water in exceeds water out, it means your salinity levels are low. There's only so much salt in the ocean. It's the water levels that change. All right, and then six says describe the layers of the ocean in terms of temperature and salinity. The topmost layers are warmer and less salty. The lower layers are colder and more salty. And then what is a pycnocline? It is an area of water in which salinity quickly goes up and temperature quickly goes down. Um, when the salinity goes up, that means that the density of the water also increases. If you've ever tried to float in a freshwater lake, you may find it to be a little difficult. If you try and float in a saltwater uh, ocean, you'll find it a lot easier. As a matter of fact, there's a place called the Dead Sea where the salinity levels are so high that it is ridiculously easy to float in the water and you just kind of hang out. Um, so let's see what else can I tell you from this slide. Uh, link a specific property of water and the ocean's impact on terrestrial climate. Water specific heat, that's this letter C here, the specific heat constant is very high. It takes a little over four joules of energy to make um, the water temperature raise one degree Celsius. Okay, you're like, who cares? What does that even mean? It takes a fraction of a joule to make, let's say, iron go up in temperature one degree Celsius. So in other words, you can pour a lot of heat into water and it stays at a pretty, its temperature doesn't change very much. So that means that it heats up very slowly and it cools off very slowly. So uh, it's it's a heat sink. It's It's a place where the sun's rays hit it and that energy from the sun stays in the ocean uh, and it doesn't let go of it very quickly, um, which keeps our planet warmer than you might otherwise predict. So thank goodness we are, in essence, a blue planet. Um, this is also from question seven, by the way. This is all question seven. What two properties of the ocean help to regulate terrestrial climate? Water's high specific heat again, and then also the ocean currents. And here is the currents look like there is no expectation that you'll actually know um, where these currents are just be aware of where they that they circulate and that some of them are warm water currents which means that they are the topmost layers and then you have cold water currents which is the stuff um, a little bit farther down and let's see so we're on question eight at this point what four things drive the ocean's currents density differences so um, lower salinity stuff stays on the top, higher salinity stuff sinks to the bottom, and so if you have water moving from the equator to those uh, desert latitudes at 30 degrees above and below the equator, uh, precipitation occurs more, uh, not precipitation, excuse me, evaporation occurs more there, so you have higher salinity water and it starts to sink, and you're, you're creating that motion because of the changing density of the water. Um, so density differences, heating and cooling, 
uh, the, the warmer stuff stays on the top, the cooler stuff sinks. So that means as water goes towards the poles, it gets colder and it sinks. And then there are hot spots in the Earth's crust that causes the water to rise. So that's, what is it? Oh yes, it's conven convection. Very good for those of you who actually remembered. Then you also have gravity, but with density differences, that's where the gravity comes in, and then wind. And you can also see uh, Cori the Coriolis effect also uh, goes to, to ocean currents that is not listed in your book. Won't be on the quiz, but you will need to know it for the national exam and possibly for your unit test. Um, how do the speeds of different currents compare? Some are very slow, while others are very quick, like the Gulf Stream. Which part of the world would be much colder if the ocean's current stopped? That would be Europe. Um, a part of the Gulf Stream, which you can see here, brings warm water from the Gulf all the way over to Europe. If this particular current just flat out stopped, it would plunge most likely Europe into a little ice age. So that's kind of an important deal right here. Uh, again, all of the working parts of the globe help to support life as we know it. And if one of them stops, there are consequences. Um, I think that pretty much covers it. That whole particular thing of if the Gulf Stream stops, Europe would become a little bit colder. I've seen that uh, question appear as a multiple choice question on the national exam. All right, upwellings. Um, we are now on question number nine. How does an upwelling occur? Two methods. One is when horizontal currents diverge due to convection. I'm going to show you that on the next slide. Or more commonly, when strong winds blow away from or parallel to coastlines, for example, along the California coastline. Here in red, you can see all the places where upwellings occur. At this point, you should be saying to yourself, hey, Morris, who cares? Well, what is, an impact, uh, what is the impact of an upwelling on a marine ecosystem? It brings nutrients from the bottom of the ocean to the surface, um, becoming areas of high primary productivity. It's basically like a buffet where primary producers, which is stuff like phytoplankton and little plants, sit there and feed, feed, and grow, grow, grow. So then other little critters come to eat the plants and bear critters eat the little critters and so on and so forth. So um, these upwelling areas are areas of high biodiversity and they occur along the coastline. You don't see upwellings in the middle of the ocean. All right, here is another way uh, that upwellings occur, and this is driven by winds and the Coriolis effect. All right, downwellings. Uh, how do you down downwellings occur in areas where surface currents converge? So diverge is the upwelling, converge is the downwelling. And why, are why is this important? Because this is the way that these deep, dark layers get dissolved oxygen. Um, you're only going to have photosynthesis in the upper layers of the ocean because, hello, that's the only place there's light. And then also, um, any atmospheric oxygen that is going to uh, dissolve in the ocean water, it's only going to occur where that interface is up here. So get, there would be no deep ocean uh, critters if there was no um, downwellings of that um, dissolved oxygen. All right, so um, what is the significance of the continental shelf? I am hoping that most of you have seen the cartoon Finding Nemo. No, we are not going to watch it in class. And they talk about something called the drop-off. Um, and if you remember from the movie, it's a place where you've literally, it's like the ocean floor just drops away. Uh, that is the end of the continental shelf. From the coastline to the continental shelf is an area of relatively um, shallow water, and that's because the tectonic plate that we're sitting on um, goes out um, shallowly anywhere between 330 feet to 800 miles out, and then it just literally just drops off the way it does in Finding Nemo. It's where the deep ocean begins. So how far offshore is it located again? And anywhere between 330 feet and 800 miles. I'm not going to ask you specific numbers. Just realize that it's a little ways off from shore. But, um, you know, at some point it does actually occur. And then you have the, the deep open ocean that occurs after that. All right. So next one, think back on plate tectonics. Understand the significance of underwater volcanoes, trenches, ridges, etc. Divergent plates is where magma comes up and uh, becomes lava and, and makes those plates bigger. So that's where you have seafloor spread. 
convergent plates uh, is where you either have an underwater mountain being built or you have a uh, volcano occur when you have subduction. And then transform plate boundaries are where you have underwater earthquakes that then cause tsunamis on the top of the water and we can remember watching those videos before. All right, and then also remember underwater hot spots are places where volcanoes occur where you would not otherwise expect them, which is around the edges of the plates. Um, there is a hot spot in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, which is where the Hawaii Islands are forming, and you can see that Loihi is currently forming underwater as we speak. All right, next question. Number 13, identify the life zones of the ocean. The photic zone, photo means light, so that is the vertical area in which light can penetrate. It depends upon the clarity of the water as to how, how deep it is. Photosynthetic organisms are here as well as most of the ocean's life. The open ocean is anything beyond the continental shelf. Um, biodiversity is not as concentrated. The pelagic zone, or some people call it the pelagic zone, who cares? Uh, that is a vertical area between the surface of the ocean and the ocean floor. It contains the photic zone and then biodiversity decreases as depth increases, we think. there We don't know a whole lot about the deepest parts of the ocean since they're miles and miles uh, below the surface. Decomposers and detrivores live here that a lot of them depend exclusively upon anything that falls from the top of the ocean down to the bottom. Describe what types of organisms can be found in each zone. Photic zone is where you have stuff that photosynthesizes and a lot of active life. And then as you go down farther and farther, stuff gets kind of weirder and is more scavenger-like and opportunistic in nature. Um, there are some interesting other types of ecosystems down on the ocean floor. Some of them will be covered in the supplemental lecture. Um, describe, blah, 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 let's see, biodiversity is concentrated in places that are shallow, lit, and near upwellings. So basically close to shore, sunlight, food source. Where can photosynthesis occur? The photic zone. Um, now stuff like the abyssal zone, we're going to cover those in the um, uh, supplemental lecture. Uh, you also need to know the benthic zone is the entire muddy bottom from the high tide mark all the way down to the lowest point of the ocean. So it's anything that's actually not water and it's the bottom. It's the same as it is in a lake. All right, we already talked about this, pelagic zone. A uh, pelagic zone is water that's further from the land. It's the open ocean. It's generally cold. Um, da -da -da -da. We've already talked about all of that. And we've talked about all that as well. All right, other marine ecosystems. These hydrothermal vents we'll talk about in the supplemental lecture. We're gonna get to the rest of these right now. So kelp forests, we already talked about this when we talked about sea otters as a uh, keystone species. Uh, the best example of these is off the coast of California. Kelp is not a plant. It is large brown algae colonies. Where can it be found? Along temperate coasts where it can anchor in relatively shallow, shallow water and use sunlight for photosynthesis. Remember this stuff grows like feet at a time. Uh, these can get to be upwards of 200 feet in length. Um, but it's not all up and down. They can only exist in places where they get sunlight because they do photosynthesize. Um, its ecological niche is not only as a primary producer, but it is a uh, place where all kinds of critters come to hang out. So it's it's got high level of biodiversity here. You don't find a lot of areas to hide when you're in the ocean. So this is popular for everything from fish to sea urchins to sea stars to sea otters to sea turtles. You find all kinds of stuff in here. Um, it's also a shelter in a shoreline storm break. It reduces erosion because as a storm comes through, it absorbs some of the impact. So without these kelp forests, you have a lot more beach erosion going on. How do humans use kelp? Uh, you consume it, think sushi, and then it's also a thickener in everything from cosmetics to paints to paper to soaps to other human foods. All right, coral reefs. Coral reefs, um, are found in shallow and lit subtropical and tropical waters. What are they physically made of? Calcium carbonate, which is capital C, lowercase a, that's calcium, capital C, capital O, um, subscript three, calcium carbonate. You definitely need to know that. Uh, what two organisms mutually live and create the coral reefs? 
Tiny invertebrate animals related to sea anemones and jellyfish are called coral polyps. And then something called zooxanthellae or zooxanthellae uh, that live embedded within the living coral polyps and they photosynthesize. The coral polyps create the calcium carbonate reef homes for both organisms. So this is an example of mutualism. Um, the zooxanthellae also contains the color um, in coral. It is not the white that you're familiar with. We'll talk about that in a sec second. Here's what calcium carbonate looks like right here. Um, and then the way that reefs grow bigger is that when uh, polyps die, new polyps attach themselves to the or old coral and gradually build the reef, kind of like an apartment complex where you abandon the lower floors and when people die. Not that this actually happens, but uh, then you build on top. All right, um, here is an example of a coral reef that completely rings an island. Um, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more during the supplemental lecture. Um, and here are all the places that coral reefs uh, exist. You can see the largest one by far is um, uh, by far are in these uh, islands along the Ring of Fire, and then also the longest contiguous one is uh, along. This is the Great Barrier Reef, and that is along the coast of uh, Australia and New Zealand. Okay, we've already talked about this. They need lots of light. Um, they have a very small zone of tolerance for changes in temperature. So they can't survive below 65 degrees Fahrenheit. There are a couple that do, but very few. Um, and then also above 85 degrees Fahrenheit, they, they have a very small sweet spot. All right, let's consult the notes. All right. Um, what is a coral reef's ecological niche? It's the shelter for high, high biodiversity. It's like the tropical rainforest of the ocean. Uh, that describes the biodiversity of the coral reefs. It's also a storm break for shorelines and it's occasional food source for fish like parrotfish. All right, what is coral bleaching? Zooxanthellae embedded in the coral polyps leave or die um, as a, uh, because uh, conditions change. We're gonna talk about that in a second. These contain the color of the reefs, leaving behind white calcium carbonate and colorless polyps. The polyps then usually die because they depend upon that photosynthesis um, from the zooxanthellae, and what causes coral bleaching? Uh, lots of things. Rising sea temperature, because coral reefs have a small uh, range of tolerance. Pollution, and that's usually from humans, uh, unknown natural causes. Acidification of water from increased levels of carbon dioxide, because we're burning more fossil fuels, and carbon dioxide is a byproduct of combustion. Um, that mixes with ocean water to create carbonic acid, which then kills the coral reefs. That's kind of a cascade effect in the same way that carbon dioxide does not kill, directly kill, um, or fossil fuels don't always necessarily directly kill coral reefs, but when fossil fuels are burned, they create carbon dioxide that then mixes with the water that creates carbonic acid that then kills the coral reefs, so it's kind of a cascading effect that you need to be able to articulate. Um, what are the ecological consequences of coral bleaching? Loss of coral, loss of marine biodiversity, because now uh, stuff doesn't have a place to live anymore. Uh, this is something that's not in your book. I will talk about during the supplemental lecture, and that is uh, if you look at a coral reef like this one, and you need to get stuff to and from the island, how the heck do you get through here? You blow up the coral reef so you can bring your ships in and you blow it all up in here so you've got a channel. So that is another way that coral reefs just, it's not coral bleaching, but that's just how they flat out die. Um, and then also there is a fishing technique that ruins them that we're gonna talk about uh, a little bit later. Here's what coral bleaching looks like. All right, next question. Des uh, describe the range of tolerance of organisms that live in intertidal zones. Intertidal zones. They have got to be essentially badasses because they have to be able to survive various levels of water, including none, various temperatures because when they're covered up with water, it's colder than when they're exposed to the sun. They have to be able to tolerate being exposed to the sun in general and air. Um, not everything can breathe in the air. Uh, constant pummeling by the waves. Uh, when there's no water, you have threats from terrestrial predators, and then when there is water, the marine guys can get to you. So you have to be able to deal with a lot. 
and intertidal zone is the mark between the high tide and the low tide if you've never been to the beach. Uh, water levels change. Uh, you have to always be careful where you put your chair because it could float away during high tide. Um, high tide is when the ocean comes in the furthest that it possibly can during that day um, up along the beach. And then low tide is when it is out at its farthest point. Uh, tides occur uh, for a variety of reasons, including the, the pull of the moon and then the, the spin of the globe and the Coriolis effect and stuff like that and ocean currents and yada, yada, yada. All right, salt marshes. Where do salt marsh marshes occur? Um, they occur coasts at temperate latitudes. How do they form? Rising and falling tides flow into and out of channels that are called tidal creeks, and then they spill over at high tide onto elevated marsh flats. So you have to think that the water levels there are continually changing. Um, what ecological function do they serve? Lots of grasses grow in here that can tolerate the um, uh, salt water that spills into them. That's kind of unusual for plants. Uh, rushes, it's a kind of uh, thick grass. Shrubs and other plants grow here, so it's an area of high primary productivity. If you have an area of high primary productivity, it means you've got a lot of other stuff that comes to live there. It's also bird habitat, especially for migrating birds that stop by for a quick snack on their way to wherever it is they're going for the winter or for the summer. Um, it is also a marine nursery for commercially important fish and shellfish. A lot of the stuff that we fish for food begins its life in a salt marsh. They also, from our perspective, filter pollution out of salt water and then they stabilize the shoreline from storm surges. When there's a storm, it pushes the ocean inland and this kind of uh, is built to absorb some of that water. So what does this mean? What can happen in areas where they are removed? Well, um, increase in flooding, especially during large storms like a hurricane, and then pollutants will also build up in the unfiltered water. And here is a clear example of um, how uh, salt marshes occur. And um, it's these things that are right here. Um, we're gonna talk about what an estuary is in just a second. And you can see salt marshes, you have varying levels of, um, of salt. You don't need to know all the specifics, like what the heck is a neap tide? Don't, don't worry about it. Just be kind of aware th about the ebb and flow of uh, water in the salt marsh. Okay, mangrove forests. Um, where are mangrove forests found? Subtropical and tropical coastlines. You can see all the red areas there, but you need to remember specifics. Thank goodness we live in a place where there are lots of mangrove forests. So Florida, Mexico, and the Philippines. Those are three great places to remember. How can these trees exist in moving muddy salt water? Well, they've got curving roots like this. You can see an above ground and a below ground uh, version of them. And the curving roots both stabilize the trees in the moving water and then they direct um, oxygen down to the roots for the plant's use. I'll show you that in a second. Um, this is not in the book, but trees can extract the salt from the water, um, exuding it through their branches and leaves. Um, that's how come they can grow in the salt water. And you find a lot of marine organisms are able to do that. And then what's interesting about these uh, mangrove trees is they can anchor themselves just out in the middle of a salty body of water and then they grow into a tree and then the roots end up catching um, dirt and eventually an island forms. And then you've got to imagine that all of these little roots in here make most excellent places for things to hide, especially little bitty fish. Um, so they are marine nurseries. They are birds feed and nest here because if you're going to have a family, why not just be able to like dip your beak into the water and get food for your young and for yourself. Um, high biodiversity in general. Why are they good for people? Uh, fishing is great in there and also little critters that spend their young life here end up going into the open ocean where we can fish them commercially. We use trees for medicine and then also for construction. All right, um, and here is the way that the roots uh, get more oxygen back into uh, this this is how they can uh, live in in the muddy water pause here for a second and just kind of get a sense of how this happens all right estuary 
This is one of our, uh, this is our last one. Uh, what is an estuary? It's where water bodies, uh, it, it, an estuary is a water body where rivers flow into the ocean, mixing fresh water with salt water. Uh, the term for that is called brackish water. I'll make sure we talk about that during a supplemental lecture. What ecological and economic services do, services do they provide? Uh, ecologically, they are shorebird, fish, and shellfish habitats, so it's an area of high biodiversity. Economically, uh, some of those fish and shellfish are commercially important. How have they been impacted by human actions? They've become polluted through everything from physical trash to fertilizers washed in from farther upstream to uh, human waste. There are places that use these areas as uh, the sewer for human waste. Also, they are beautiful places to live, so coastal development has altered or destroyed them. We've overfished them. We've reduced the fresh water that flows into them due to river overuse. Describe the different conditions that exist in an estuary at different times of day and at different places in the estuary. Incoming tide, the saltiness increased and water levels go up. Outgoing tide, it's the opposite. And then the farther you are from the ocean, the less salty the water. Alright, and here is a nice graphic for you. If this seems like it is vaguely familiar to you, that is because, oh, it is. Uh, here's Lake Okeechobee. Here is the Caloosahatchee. Please don't call it the Caloosahatchee River if at all possible. The Caloosahatchee means the Caloosa River. Hatchee is the Caloosa word for river. So when you're saying the Caloosahatchee River, you're saying the Caloosa River River. All right, and then right here where it flows out is an estuary. And then you can see the barrier islands that are around it. So this is this. And if you look, see how this kind of looks like a triangle? This area, estuaries, are also referred to as a delta. And that brings us to the end of this particular segment of chapter 16.